Hello and welcome to the ADHD Writers Workshop, where we watch movies to learn about writing. What? I can't see movies too? Yeah, that is spot on. With scary precision. No, seriously, I can't watch movies anymore without looking for references to grammar or writing, and I kind of like it. Today I want to address a topic that I've been seeing a lot lately, from students' research papers to Disney Plus series. How to take an idea and find the right form to express it. The main idea to look out for here is that you want to structure your writing around your ideas, content, tone, or message. I owe you an apology. The test was wrong to classify us both as I9C3G6s. That's a terrible apology from content to tone. Let's take a look at this concept as part of my first ever literature review. Literature reviews are examinations of writing principles and grammar usage in popular stories, whether they be movies, books, or video games, so we can learn from them and become better writers and masters of the English language. In today's literature review, I want to take a look at Flowers for Algernon by Daniel Keyes to see how the content of your writing can be enhanced by the form or structure of your writing. Flowers for Algernon was written originally as a short story in 1958, before Keyes expanded it into a full-length novel in 1966. For the purpose of this video, we'll study the novel and we'll use clips from the film adaptation directed by Jeff Blechner in the year 2000. Flowers for Algernon is an account of Charlie Gordon, who has a mental disability and undergoes an experimental surgery in an attempt to artificially raise his IQ. The story tackles several meaningful themes, including experimental ethics, how learning and love develop over time, and issues surrounding society's treatment of the mentally disabled. Ethical responsibility. No, I don't. The old Charlie agreed to this, not me. Come on, Charlie, you're splitting hair. Let's take a look at the form of this novel and how it makes those themes impactful for the reader. The novel is written in the first-person perspective through Charlie's journal entries that he keeps throughout the experiment. We see everything through his perspective, the plot, the other characters, and all the details about the world around him. His first entries are full of spelling and grammar errors, and they tend to be very short. Charlie mentions several times how much difficulty he has with reading and writing, and although he always has a good attitude and sees the world rather innocently, the reader can see how difficult it is for him to interact with the environment around him. For instance, his work colleagues make fun of him and bully him constantly, but Charlie interprets it as them trying to make friends with him. Then, Charlie undergoes the surgery and slowly starts to gain more and more intelligence, growing until he surpasses even the researcher's IQ levels. I'm smarter than you, aren't I? Say it! Yes? Yes, Charlie, you are smarter than me. Along the way, he struggles with the sudden transformation of intellectual intelligence as he tries to make friends and find his place in the world, eventually noting that his emotional intelligence didn't grow in parallel with his intellectual intelligence. We don't have an operation to make people emotional geniuses, and we never will. But I'm glad to be your friend. Me too. <laughs> His journal entries get more sophisticated, becoming free of grammar and spelling errors, and instead taking on a very intelligent language and making meaningful points. Towards the end of the novel, Charlie realizes that his IQ will soon return to the same level it was at before the surgery, and he writes about his struggles with this idea as well as significantly difficult personality dissonance. But now, my heart is overwhelmed with my head. After conducting his own research on the artificial IQ experiment, Charlie's worst fears are confirmed as he slowly starts to lose his newly acquired intelligence. You've come a long way, haven't you, Charlie Gordon? You're about as ethically responsible now as they are. Well, I wouldn't worry, Miss Kenyon. We'll soon have the old Charlie Gordon back, and he'll let people treat him any way they like. By showing us the world through Charlie's eyes, Keyes is able to change the narrative in a way that he couldn't do if this were a classic third-person story. For starters, we as readers feel more sympathetic to Charlie when we can see his thoughts. When you understand the world as someone else sees it and feel the same things they do, they affect you much more personally, which is an effect that Keyes would not have been able to achieve had he not given us a window directly into Charlie's thoughts. This makes Charlie's struggles so much more emotionally impactful for the reader. We feel so much sympathy for him when he's getting bullied at his job, and we understand more clearly why he acts the way he does, because his emotions and thoughts are laid out plainly for us to view. Another cool effect that this form produces is how much power it gives the themes of the story. 
The book's messages about society's treatment of the mentally disabled and research ethics take on so much more importance when we see how distraught Charlie is with his self-image after he gets his newfound intelligence. I was deeply affected by the ending of the book when Charlie's journal entries slowly start to get infected by more and more spelling and grammar errors, and he describes how scared he is to lose his intelligence. He's not sure who he is anymore, or who he even was before, or what he's gonna be once he doesn't have any more of this intelligence. And it's all mirrored by the fact that we can see this happening to him on a physical level. Not only do we know that he's really scared of losing his intelligence, but we see that slowly start to happen to him because of how we read his writing. Now let's move on to some other examples of how form can mirror content. If you've seen any of the Disney Plus Star Wars series lately, you might have seen some arguments that they should have been movies instead. There are a variety of different arguments in favor of making these series into movies, but notably because the stories could have been more focused in a movie instead of a series, where audiences felt like there was a lot of narrative fluff in each episode. I sense a presence I've not felt in a long time. Nerds! Ah, you again. Look, we're not nerds. If we're nerds, you're nerds. Yeah, right. I'm a Sith Lord, and you're a bald guy in pajamas. Can you do this? This is a prime example of how form needs to be built around content, not the other way around. Movies, TV series, and books are all suited for different ideas. When you have an idea of something to write, think about how you want it to be represented. Is it best in video, writing, or some other form? Should it be a poem, a novel, or a movie? Think about how the form can be molded around the ideas. How could you best show your ideas and messages? Public domain, Title IX, Save the Search State Resource Code, but I tell you what, man, is there tight. Boomhauer, I didn't understand a word you just said. There are lots of great examples of pieces that do this well that I'll link in the description of this video if you want to learn more. So definitely go check those out. It's 100% worth your time. Lastly, this idea even works with structuring your paragraphs in essays. Think about all your supporting evidence, which is basically just all the ideas you want to describe throughout your essay that support your main idea. How much space do you need for each idea? How many sources, statistics, anecdotes, or other pieces of evidence do you have to back up those ideas? Give each idea the space they need to work. That could be one paragraph, that could be 20, depending on whatever idea you're working with. Then make sure that each paragraph is concise as a unit and makes a specific claim about the supporting idea that it's describing, so your reader doesn't get lost between each paragraph. Like you don't have to read all of this, most of it's for your parents. Boring, adult business, but this paragraph right here, this is important. Also, make sure that all your evidence, like sources, anecdotes, and statistics, are woven throughout your ideas. We want your evidence and your paragraph structure to support your ideas, not the other way around. Thank you very much for sticking with me throughout this episode, and make sure to check the description if you want to learn more about form and content. I'll put some cool links in the description to some of my sources, and also some other examples of how cool form can be. This is really one of my most favorite ideas in writing, and I hope that you can see why. It's really cool when you can get to a point with your writing where you can try and experiment with different kinds of form and see how you can convey meaning, not only through your words, but in how you put those words on the paper. You can also shoot me an email if you have any suggestions for how I can improve my channel, or you can even recommend a concept that you want me to cover in an episode. Make sure to tune in next week when we'll talk a little bit more about some rhetorical appeals and their effects on communication. Now get out there and go change the world with your writing. See you next time.